Ladies and gentlemen, Lydia Polgreen. I first met Rick Meaty when we were correspondents together in West Africa. Um, I had uh, recently been named the West Africa Bureau Chief of the New York Times. She was the new kid on the block from uh, the Associated Press. And I wondered, what's up with this woman? She filed an incredibly beautiful story that I envied. It was about how young people, the, the, the marriage rituals of young people in Guinea-Bissau and how the women choose the men and not the other way around. And there was an amazing poetry to the way that she wrote. Um, and there was a, the, 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 the detail and the gorgeousness of the way that she rendered these, these beautiful love stories. Uh, I looked her up and I said, oh, she's a poet, that's why. So that kind of special touch to her work is something that Rukmini has brought, whether she's covering the Christmas, lighting ceremony, Christmas tree lighting ceremony in a small town or interviewing uh, women who are sex slaves of ISIS. Uh, she brings that touch to everything she does. We were competitors, of course, but we were also friends. Uh, we worked side by side many times. And the last time I worked in the field with Rukmini, was in Mali, and rebels aligned to Al-Qaeda had taken over the northern part of the country, and the French military had arrived to help the Malian government sweep them away. Um, we were all desperate to get to the newly liberated Timbuktu. Um, there were no flights, all the roads were closed, but that wasn't gonna stop Rukmini. She hired a four by four with an exceptionally brave dot driver. She would mapped out several different routes. One possible route was, uh, we looked at a map together, there was a, a lots of rivers and deltas, and she said, no, I think if we just go this way, we could get through them and we could actually get up to Timbuktu. That didn't work out. But eventually, she sweet-talked and bullied her way through every roadblock. Ever the great colleague, she luckily had invited me along for the ride, and luckily enough, we made it to Timbuktu. Um, at the time, of course, I was a reporter for the New York Times, and I thought, I'm the big kid here, I'm gonna do all the great stories. But I could only watch slack-jawed as she scooped me again and again and again. Uh, when she heard that Al-Qaeda uh, was using a government building as its headquarters, uh, she went to that building and scoured every inch of it and took away trash bags full of documents that detailed the way that the group uh, ruled and had set up an Islamic state, their justice system, the way that they charge people taxes, the way that Al-Qaeda fighters filed expenses. Nobody had read these stories before. They were amazing. Um, and it wasn't just about holding the, it wasn't just about telling the story of the terrible things that the militants had done. She also held the Malian government to account. When she heard about atrocities that had been committed by the Malian army, that they had carried out summary executions of Malian of Arabs, she actually, took a shovel out to the desert with her co Malian colleague, and they attempted to dig up the bodies of victims of these summary executions. It was extraordinary work. So once I went back to New York and became an editor on the international desk, I thought, if you can't beat them, you may as well hire them. So my first order of business was to uh, get Rukmini Kalamaki a job at the New York Times as a correspondent. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in my career. Her fierce and penetrating coverage of terrorism is utterly unique. Rukmini is an exemplar of relentlessness, of courage, of rigor, of humanity and kindness. It's an honor to present her this award. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm Rukmini, and I cover uh, the Islamic State now for the New York Times, which is possibly the most vicious uh, terrorist group in the world. It was not always so, and in the few minutes that I have with you, I wanted to talk about beginnings, because mine were particularly humble in this profession. Um, I came to journalism quite late. Uh, I was 27 when I began as a freelance reporter, and 28 when I decided to try to get a full-time job in this profession. So what I did is I went online and looked up the top 100 newspapers by circulation in the US. I had an Oxford degree, a Dartmouth degree, and I thought, this is gonna be a piece of cake. I uh, printed out my rather thin CV and sent it out to the top 100 newspapers. And of the top 100 newspapers, I got exactly two replies. <laughs> um, and of those, only one offered me a job, and it was an internship. 
The newspaper was called the Daily Herald of Arlington Heights, Illinois. They paid me so little that A, I ran out of gas on my way to the office during my first month of work, <laughs> and shamefaced, I had to call a colleague to come and pick me up uh, on the shoulder of the I-90 in Chicago. And B, when I was working on a story about people on welfare, I learned that I actually qualified for food stamps. <laughs> The first assignment that I was sent to cover uh, was the municipal Christmas tree lighting ceremony in a small town in Illinois called Streamwood, Illinois, population then 30,000. You know the ritual. There's a Christmas tree in the center of town, and they, they light it uh, ahead of the, the holidays, and my job was to go and interview people about this ritual. So I guess my story was okay, because my editor then assigned me to do a story about the Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Hanover Park, Illinois another little town. And then to my horror, I was assigned to do a third Christmas tree lighting ceremony <laughs> in the town of Bartlett, Illinois. And at this point, I really thought my life was over. <laughs> I was dreaming of becoming a foreign correspondent, but apparently my full-time beat had become Christmas tree lighting ceremonies. I knew I had to double down and di dig deep to figure out how to elevate these parochial stories so that an editor somewhere might take notice of me. And so I poured myself into every assignment, uh, trying to find that one ray of light, that one tiny, interesting detail that might make people care. But you know what? As humbling as that experience was, the skills I learned then, um, how to make something boring, interesting, are the exact same skills that I use today when I'm sitting across from a captured Islamic State fighter, looking him in the eye and asking him to describe to me the atrocities that he's committed. Uh, I'm deeply honored uh, by this award. And in closing, I would like to say um, that one of the things that has, that has buoyed me in this profession is the female mentors that I've, that I've made along the way. At my first newspaper job at the Daily Herald, Renee Trappi, who was my very first editor, looked over my, my many mistakes, including misspelling the name of the mayor of the town that I was covering. <laughs> Later at the AP, Mary Rajkumar uh, became my editor, also a woman. I felt invisible until Mary came on the scene, and under her, her watchful gaze, I became a Pulitzer finalist twice. And what Lydia did not mention is that I had applied every single year to the New York Times, starting in 2005, up until 2014, <laughs> coming in repeatedly, interview after interview, meeting after meeting, and it wasn't until Lydia took an interest in my work that I finally came to the Times. I'm deeply thankful to the Matrix Committee. I thank my husband, Mikhail Lafarge, my mother and father, my editors at the New York Times, and everyone who has helped me along the way. Thank you.